Now for today's political roundtable is Eric Bates. Mm -hmm. He's the executive editor of Rolling Stone magazine. The magazine has a high profile piece in its latest issue called The Spill, The Scandal and The President. Tell us about the story. What do we learn? Well, we learned two things. We learned the Obama administration knew well in advance of this spill that it had a major problem on its hands in terms of the regulatory structure. It did almost nothing to reform the structure as it had promised to. And then once the spill occurred, it really dropped the ball and knew that the spill could be very, very big pretty much from the first few hours. Uh, and it took its eyes off the ball. What, what warnings did it have? Well, in advance, there were warnings going all the way back to the Clinton administration, reports that said that a spill uh, could happen of this magnitude, up to 100,000 barrels a day. Uh, the Bush administration uh, greenlighted a lot of uh, drilling, but the Obama administration, Ken Salazar in his first year, put more uh, acres of uh, up for release in the Gulf than anybody ever had in history in a single year, 53 million acres. So you're saying more in 2009, more acres were put in up for, lease for in oil the Gulf. leases in the Gulf it's than an any year ever? All time high. All why, time why high. Why is that? Was it just uh, trying to... Uh, do, get dependence off of foreign oil? Yeah, well, Salazar has always been for drilling. Uh, he helped open up the Gulf for drilling, including the lease block uh, that the BP drilled uh, when he was a senator. So he's always been for this, and he went full speed ahead as soon as they got in office. And then they pushed for uh, more offshore drilling. Donnie? I have a question. In any, are there warnings everywhere and everything in our society that whenever anything goes bad, you're going to be able to trace it back, and in reality, what could we have done different? I think in any scenario we live in a world, I don't know if I'm not being clear, forgive me for a second. No, I understand that, exactly what you're saying. You could always point and say, I told you so, yeah. look at this right. report, look yeah. at that report. The difference here is that even before he took office, Obama was pointing to this as a problem and appointed Ken Salazar specifically to clean up the mess. Said there's a huge, uh, there's criminality in minerals and management services, the regulatory agency that oversees drilling. Uh, I'm putting Ken Salazar in charge. His first few days, Ken Salazar flew out to Colorado to the headquarters of MMS, said there's a new sheriff in town, you guys are out of control, I'm going to clean you up, and then they didn't do it. But you, you say Ken Salazar, though, actually supported offshore oil drilling in the Gulf, that he helped open it up. So That's right. that sheriff would appear to be a sheriff that had inclinations that would be a bit more helpful to oil drilling. Certainly in this area, he was helpful to oil drilling. What was alarming is that he didn't make sure that that drilling was safe. It's one thing to say you're for drilling, you can have a lot of argument one way or the other about that. But if you're going to drill, it's got to be safe. And he didn't take the steps he needed so to do. So talk about the first days after the spill. Your article also touches on sure. that, you say. One of, the, one of the things that we found was there was a video uh, that uh, the government posted briefly on one of its websites that showed the war room right after the spill occurred, uh, where some of the top officials were meeting to discuss it. And on a whiteboard uh, behind them, you can clearly see written that their estimate of the spill went up over 100,000 barrels. So within hours of the spill, their own experts knew that this could be a spill of catastrophic magnitude, and yet they were going out on TV and claiming that they, first, that they didn't even have an estimate, wow. and second, mm -hmm. that that estimate was something like a thousand barrels a day, uh, which they knew was going to be underrated. Well, why would they do that, Eric? Why would they lowball it? I think the, the, that uh, BP clearly had a reason to lowball it and was giving them some misleading information early on because they were going to have to pay a lot of money. Uh, the administration, I think, was worried about the future of its offshore drilling program. It's trying to open up even more drilling in the Arctic, in the Gulf, uh, all up and down the eastern seaboard. And so it had a, a political motivation to try and downplay this as well and to keep it low-key. Well, that sounds pretty yeah, cynical I, I that know. they're thinking about the politics of it as oil is spilling into the Gulf. But you say they've got the whiteboard and it's written behind them? It's written behind them. The experts in the room are saying this could be the spill of the decade. It's very clear that they know the size and the magnitude of this. Uh, and they're going out in public and, and saying it's not very much. Now, within a few hours, they heard from BP that the spill was limited to the oil that had been stored on the rig, that there was actually no oil spilling out. So at that point, they sort of called off the dogs. They thought, oh, okay, it's not going to be that bad. And it took them several days after that to realize, no, we've got a major problem. You know, you know Mika, this is, this is fascinating. This encapsulates the White House's problem. Uh, we've had people on here, some progressives, some thought leaders, most everybody's saying there's a problem uh, with this White House. Here you have Rolling Stone, a progressive magazine, uh, and as we learned last week, uh, only one of three covers in Rolling Stone history just showed somebody's face without any writing on it, and one of them was Barack Obama, obviously a man that Rolling Stone invested a lot of hopes into. Uh, and. Now they have this investigative piece. Also, Charlie uh, Rangel, 
Uh, yeah. Did you see what Charlie Rangel well, said this that. weekend? Uh, yes, New York Congressman Charlie Rangel apparently compared Vice President Dick Cheney uh, to, uh, to the president. Based Former on what? What was the comparison? Well, the, uh, the, 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 the Iraq wars, war. The Iraq wars. And, he said uh, this over the weekend. I'll read it. I challenge anyone to tell me we aren't there because of the oil. The lack of an honest explanation for the war is consistent with Bush and Cheney. He also said, we're trying to buy our friends there. Stuff like that makes Cheney look good. And, and I guess the, if you look at the common denominator with this investigative piece and also what Charlie Rangel said, it's oil. It's oil. It's oil. And every president... But wasn't this president begrudgingly kind of to oil. Given, uh, giving in a little bit to offshore oil drilling? He was. But also other. I, I didn't. I it, it was a balance. He struck a compromise. And so the White House would say to progressives, say, listen, we, we've got to govern here. We can't do everything that progressives want on financial reform sure. or on offshore drilling or on the stimulus package, they do have to govern, right? Well, it was clear that one of the reasons they're pushing for more offshore drilling is to try to win votes for climate legislation. So they sort of had a short-term versus long-term strategy. Okay, we, offshore drilling may not be the greatest. For now, it'll help us with energy independence. And for the long term, if we can buy some votes with that in Congress uh, to get us off of oil, right. that's a long-term good. But they may have wound up trading one environmental catastrophe for another because they didn't do enough to make sure that that drilling was safe and done according to the law. Hmm. All right. Eric Bates, executive editor of Rolling Stone magazine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Good to have we love you having you here. Coming up, can